Welcome to Calvary Miami Beach. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Miami Beach. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Miami Beach. Welcome to Calvary Miami Beach. to whatever you want to do. God, I pray for, for these people who've gathered together that you, would, that you would meet each one of them where they are. That you would make each one personally and profoundly aware of your presence. that they would be able to, to sense you here. And that they wouldn't be distracted by the imperfections of the preacher or the fire truck sirens that go by or anything else, but Lord, that they would be ministered to by Your Spirit, taught by You today as we open the Scriptures, as we consider Your Holy Word. We ask You to apply it down deep inside each one of our lives. And Lord, we pray for our world today. There's so many things going on and so many crises happening all over the place. The one in Venezuela, as Nareem reminded me a little while ago, there's just there's such, such heartbreak and such opportunity for the gospel. So we pray, God. We pray for the people who are trapped and hoping for something better. We pray for your perfect plan to unfold, particularly in Venezuela today. So now we commit this time to you and we ask you, God, to use it for your purposes in our lives. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, for years and years and years, the Christian church in the United States has taught us that our priorities for life, you know, should, the, the, the structure, the way we should order our priorities, that, that we should always put God first, and then our families, and then ministry, church, work, you know, everything else comes, comes after that, right? God first, then family, and then these other things. But what have we been getting that wrong? What if, what if we've been wrong about the way we've structured everything? I mean, clearly family is extremely important to God because the Scriptures tell us over and over and over again, you know, I mean, right from the very beginning, He tells us, you know, uh, you know obey your, your mother and father, you know, honor your parents. You know, he, talks to, he tells us that if a man who doesn't provide for his own family is worse than an infidel. You know, he's like, you've you got to take care of your family, you've got to provide for your family. All these things, the family's emphasized, right? Over and over and, and over again. We know that God deliberately designed the family structure. It's not coincidental. I mean, I think maybe, maybe a lot of times we don't think that much about it, but it's not coincidental that we have a mother and a father. You know, the family union, a unit as it's laid out, is something that God did on purpose. Brothers and sisters, and you know, even Jesus was born into a human family, and, and it didn't have to be that way. 
but he came, he, he came as an infant, he, he entered into a family, he, he grew up with brothers and sisters. But what if there's a bigger picture here, you know, a larger plan that, that we've not fully understood or totally appreciated concerning God's priorities for our lives? I, I think here in Matthew chapter 12, you know, as we continue to work through, and, and today actually we'll, we'll finish up chapter 12, but, but, but we see Jesus confronting this issue of family and belonging. In Matthew 12, 46, the Bible says, concerning Jesus, while he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, look, your your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now now think about this. We're going to stop right there. Think about this with me for just a minute. I mean, because Jesus, it it seems like he was still in Capernaum. He was in a synagogue. And Matthew says the the multitudes are there. He's He's talking to, you know, this big crowd of people. So there's... I don't know, hundreds if not thousands of people. If you, if you go to Israel with us in October, we, one of the places we always visit is the ruins of Capernaum. And you can see the, you know, the synagogue, the synagogue that's there now, the ruins of the synagogue that are, that are there now are built on top of the ruins of the synagogue where Jesus w- would have taught. And it's not much bigger than this. But it's overflowing with people. Multitudes. And as he's talking, some guy interrupts his teaching. Now, let me just tell you, that's not cool. That, the, the first time that ever happened to me, some guy did it when we were down in South Beach. We'd only been going maybe a month. So this would have been 1993 or early 1994. But I think it was, I think it was December of 1993, because Steve Cole, who, who is now the pastor of Calvary Chapel in the city in Boston, it was it, he and Stephanie's first Sunday, I'm almost positive, December 1993, some guy sitting right about there where George Vetia is, I got a question, and I said no, and he's like, what do you mean no, and I said, this is not interactive, if you want interactive, come back, I told him when we did interactive, but Sunday morning's not, interact- not interactive, no, but I got a question. And I just looked at one of the, you know, one of the young guys in the back. I'm like, he's got a question, you know. <laughs> so take him outside and answer his question. Interrupting. This guy interrupts. Jesus got a multitude of people. He's teaching. And this guy interrupts. Why does he interrupt? Well, because he thought he had something important to say. Right? I mean, that's why you interrupt. Your mom's outside. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, because, come on, I mean, everybody knows family, mama, is a VIP, right? I mean, we still do that. The Catholic Church has built a lot around that, mama being a VIP. Am I right? Now, see, surely... They would take priority and be granted immediate access to Jesus, even a private place to talk with him. But Jesus, he he didn't stop everything. He didn't drop everything. And oh, by all means, bring mama in. Instead, what does he do? Well, he incorporated the unbelief of his brothers, because by the way, John tells us, John chapter 7, verse 5, that even his own brothers didn't believe in him. In Mark chapter 3, Mark, talking about that, Mark suggests that his brothers thought he'd lost his mind. 
Mark says his own people thought he'd gone crazy. And see, Jesus knew this. He knew when this guy interrupts and says, your mother and your brothers are outside, he knew they're here to Baker Act me. I'm not going. And instead, he looks and he says, who are my mother and my brothers? So he confronts this idea with a critically important question. Who are my mother and my brothers? And it had to be confusing, you know, initially to the people who were, who were there. Because, I mean, everybody knew. You know, it's like, it, come on, Jesus. Mary, it, Mary. Mary's your mother. Mary, she's right there. She's right outside the door. Your brothers, we know all four of them. We've got their names in the Bible. James, Jude, Simon, and, and, and Joseph, Joseph. Just call him Joe, right? So we, it's like we know all four of them. They're right there. But that's not what he was talking about. Jesus was doing what he often does. He was redirecting the focus of his audience from the horizontal to the vertical. We live our lives focused this way. And so Jesus was reframing their worldview. You know, the best way I've heard this worded is that we all walk around, everybody, every human being, we live our lives with, with, with like tinted glasses on. In, in other words, we're looking through lenses at everything we see. Everything in life you interpret through the view of the world that you learned when you were a child. You get it pretty well established as a kid. So that, you know, like, for example, if, if, you, if you grew up in, a, in an atheist household, and, and then at, at the age of, I don't know, let's just pick a number, 24, you come to know the Lord Jesus. you still see life to some degree through the worldview of an atheist. Unless you deliberately work on it to bring it in line with the Bible. Do you understand? Because you, you, you grow up being indoctrinated into a particular value system, a particular way of thinking about things. And so whatever you read, whatever you see, whatever you encounter, you interpret through that lens. Your view of life, your view of the world is colored by, that's the reason I said the glasses thing, colored by this perspective on life that became really concretely established in your mind when you were five, six, seven, eight, fourteen, fifteen, 15, your childhood. Now, one of the things that gets really, for most of us, really solidly ground into our minds and into our hearts is that family comes first. Family comes first. Blood first. Family comes first. Jesus challenged that presupposition. And without saying it, through asking a question, he assaulted their assumption. They thought he was just going to drop everything. I mean, he should. It's the right thing to do. You should, your mom's outside, bro. And Jesus confronts that. He says, who, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? You see, his, even though his mother and his brothers were important to him, G Jesus lived his life on earth focused on eternity and motivated by the mission his father, our father, had sent him to accomplish. And so he immediately answered his own question. Verse 49 said he stretched out his hand toward his disciples... And he said, here are my mother and my brothers. 
For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my, my brother and sister and mother. Don't miss the significance of this. See, Jesus said, you think the most important relationships to me are the biological ones. But in reality, the relationships that are most important to me are the eternal ones. The, the ones who are connected to me even more deeply than DNA. You ever thought about the fact that there were, there were people on earth who shared some of the DNA with Jesus? But he said, those are not my greatest priority. The people he was most concerned about and gave the highest priority to were those who were receiving his word and beginning to live it out. Those of you who actually are trying to do the will of your Father in Heaven, He makes you a priority. Now, this could seem kind of cold at first. It's like He's, you know, blowing off His own mom and His brothers. But, but no, 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 that's, that's not really what's going on. You have to stop and consider. See, He, he understood something that we often miss. He understood that a, that a connection at the level of the Spirit is much more substantial and profound than a connection at the level of our DNA. In 1943, a psychologist named Abraham Maslow wrote a book. He titled it Motivation and Personality. And he suggested that all human beings are motivated to do whatever they do, whatever actions, whatever activities. They're, they're motivated to act in order to fulfill certain basic foundational needs that we all have. And, and he believed that, that once our need for food and water and shelter, yeah, the Maslow's Pyramid... Most of you have seen it. Right at the bottom, physiological. Once those needs have been met, the need for food, the need for water, the need for shelter, the need for clothing, the, the, you know, the need for safety, the, the, the very next thing in terms of importance, he said, is our need to belong. Love, belonging. And he concluded that, that, that every human has that need to be truly connected with other people and, and connected more deeply than we can connect on social media, right? Facebook and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. No, we need FaceTime. We need to actually sit and make contact and connect with other humans. Even us introverts need to connect and belong with other humans. So, see, what we need to recognize is that God made us that way. That's, that's, it's not accidental. God deliberately did it. God deliberately made you with a need to belong somewhere with someone, with people. He deliberately gave us this family structure this nurturing environment, this little tiny, you know, social construct where we could be nurtured and fed, not just physically, but emotionally, spiritually. Where we could be trained, where we could be taught. And usually the very first deep human connection that forms is with mama. I remember, you know, my, my mother worked for a couple of doctors when I was a little boy for, gosh, I don't know, 20, 25 years she worked for the same little group of doctors. One of them was a surgeon. And, and he, he talked about how 90-year-old men would call out for mama on the operating table when they were under anesthesia. It's mama they would cry out for when they were in pain. Mama. And then daddy, ideally, right? Daddy, siblings, 
But, but see, here's, here's the problem. Our very first set of parents in, in the very beginning messed everything up, right? Because of that, as time goes by, the human race continues to be increasingly corrupted by sin, more and more influenced by the evil one, and our biological families therefore become more and more broken and dysfunctional. We talk about, you know, how, how you know, he, he comes from a dysfunctional family. Well, so do I. I mean, we all do. One degree or another. There's no such thing tr- as a truly functional family. Even Adam and Eve. You know, I mean, just go back. One brother killed another. Hello? Started in the garden. Or just outside. Right in the very beginning. Our biological families are flawed. And and Jesus said this about it in in Matthew chapter 10, and we looked at this, we studied it a few weeks ago. Matthew 10, 34, Jesus said, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be those of his own household he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me he who finds his life will lose it and he who loses his life for my sake will find it There are billions and billions and billions of people out there desperate to fit in somewhere. Desperate to belong. But desperately lost. Disconnected. Like Paul said, hopeless and without God in the world. Despairing. And you and I have the answer. We have the solution to their need. But we're often oblivious ourselves because our priorities are confused. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed for us. And in His prayer, we find the key to understanding more fully the plan for our fulfillment. Let me me read part of it to you. John chapter 17, beginning at verse 15, Jesus said, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them. In other words, set them apart by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. What's he saying? That we would live by the truth. That we would live by the word. Not by what we think we know, or what the world tells us, or even what the church tells us but what the Bible tells us, what the Word of God tells us. And he goes on, he says, I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. So now he's praying for you and me. He's making it clear that he's talking about those of us who would come after. Verse 21, that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I've given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect. And the idea there is completeness. That they may be made full, complete, whole, perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Me, You see, this oneness that Jesus prayed for and then made possible through His death and resurrection is the solution to our need for belonging. I I have family, family members, individual family members for whom I have great affection. But I don't share the connection 
with them that I have with some of you. I mean, we, yeah, we share some of the same DNA. But you and I are being made one by God at the very core of our being. It's fascinating to me. I, I have met Christians in other countries that I quickly made a deeper bond with than I have with some of my own family. I remember the, the first time I ever went to Israel, we were, it was daylight. We went out, we were staying at a, a little kibbutz on the Sea of Galilee, and a couple of the guys wanted to go out on the dock and watch the sun come up over the Sea of Galilee and have a time of worship. So a group of us went, and we're standing out there on the end of this pier, and um, we're all sleepy, you know, sun's coming up, and, and we're singing one of the, I don't even remember what it was, but it was just one of the really old choruses, you know, nobody was playing an instrument, somebody just started singing this old worship chorus, and then we hear a group of voices behind us. And they were, gosh, at least as far as from here to the back door of the sanctuary, away from us. But it was a, it was a group of Japanese Christians. And they were singing the same worship chorus, because they recognized the melody, but in Japanese. And we connected with them and hung out, and just over breakfast that day and dinner that night, and then we went our, our separate ways, but but there was a connection. It was, and it was real. It was, it was significant. And there was the awareness that one day we're going to do this around the throne at the feet of Jesus. Language won't matter. It won't get in the way. We're being made one. Paul talked about it when he wrote to the Ephesian church. To me, it's one of the incredible mysteries of the New Testament. Beautiful mysteries that Paul writes about beginning at verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 2 and he's, he's writing to them about the separation between Jew and non-Jew. The, the Jews were you know, originally given the testimony of God. They received from God the revelation about who He is and what His plans are. And, and so Paul says, for, for he himself is our peace. Talking about Jesus. Jesus himself is our peace who has made both one. Jew and non-Jew. He's, he's made them one. And has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two. Thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. Thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you're no longer strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints. Members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Do you understand what Paul is saying right there? God is building us together into a dwelling place, a temple, a dwelling place for the Spirit of God. He's making you one. Now he, he changes it up a little bit in Ephesians chapter 5. We're not going to go there, but he's, he starts talking about marriage and the beauty of husband and wife becoming one new, you know, one flesh and, 
And, and then at the end of it all, he, he says, but actually I'm not talking about husband and wife, I'm talking about Christ and the church. This beautiful thing that he, that he writes about, the fact that you and I who sincerely follow Jesus and seek to do the will of our Father are being joined together in, in a way that those who don't know Jesus can't experience. They cannot have that. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead gives life to our mortal bodies and, and, and He fits us together at the level of the Spirit into a dwelling place for Almighty God. And, and, and of course, we don't always see this clearly because not everybody who calls themselves a Christian is actually in Christ. So they're not, they're not actually part of the building. They're not actually part of the body. They're, they're not actually becoming one with us. And see, here's the thing. If you're not truly in Christ... If the Spirit of the living God doesn't live inside you, well then, you're still longing for that fulfillment, the fulfillment of your need to belong. You don't quite fit in with the fanatics who are just crazy for Jesus. But you see, we're crazy for Jesus because He's given us what you're still searching for. We belong. I, I can still remember the, you know, the, the, the realization that because of what he's done, because of what he's doing inside me, I belong to him and to other Christians. And yeah, I'm still messed up. I'm still making mistakes. I still shoot my mouth off when I ought to keep it shut. I'm still being changed by Him. All that's true. He's still working inside me. But I belong. He has prepared a place for me in His Father's house. His Father is my Father. We belong to each other because we belong to Him. And if, if you don't, if as you sit there right now you think, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have that. Well, you need to know, I mean, He died to buy it for you. He purchased you on the cross. That's what the Bible says. All that's required of you is that you bow before Him. You, you humble yourself. He's paid for everything. That's what this is about. We call it communion. You know, so sometimes people complain that we don't do it often enough. That's on purpose. Because when I was a little boy growing up, going to church, the church that I grew up in, the church that many of you grew up in, took something extraordinary And just made it very ordinary. It just became a ritual. You just do it. And I decided a long time ago that that we were just we weren't going to do that. You know it. This this is intended. Not to be a weekly ritual or a monthly ritual. It's, in, it's intended by Him to be like a memorial service. A- 
actually what we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and, you know, in, in the Gospels, you know, when, when Jesus did this, he, he did it at the Passover. So it was an annual thing. Once a year. We do it more often than that. But he wants us to remember the death that he died. The price that he paid to make it possible for you to belong in his family. And his family, he says, is more important than your family. We're going we're gonna to be with each other forever. It doesn't end with the grave. It's eternal. Several years ago, a young lady came in here and accepted Jesus. God did just this profound work in her life. And she started plugging in and getting involved. And one day, it was one of those, just one of those moments, you know, where I felt like the Lord had something to say to her. And I didn't make a big deal of it, but I I said, you know, this is, this that you've entered into with us is eternal. Everything everything in her life, not everything, but a lot of things in her life had, had been probably like for many of you, not so permanent. And I said, this is forever. And somewhere along the way, I will disappoint you. I will offend you. I'll make you mad at me. But it's still forever. Still forever. Because Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 that we who love Him would be made one in Him, with Him. I I don't understand it all. I just know He died to make it possible and that He's currently working inside us to make it happen. And we need to get with the program. We need to stop prioritizing people and situations above His priority. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Let me, let me make it really practical. Many of you will drop everything when Aunt Gertrude calls or Uncle Zebedee or whatever. Or grandma. Drop everything. It doesn't matter what's going on. You don't even have to pray about it. But you should. How do I know? Because Jesus said so. They're not always priority one. Not always. Now I get it. Okay. Mama's important, right? But do you understand she's not more important than God? She's not more important than Jesus? And a lot of times we play around with that, but the reality is we put family first and we don't even talk to him about what should occupy that position. Now I've had to deal with this in my own life more than once. If you want more details, we'll have to meet in private. This is one time I ain't putting it on tape. But do you understand? We need to recognize that our worldview is just as flawed and imperfect as we are. And that we need to submit it to the Scriptures and we need to pray and seek God about the decisions and the priorities that we establish in our lives. Now, now listen. See, some of you don't even know Jesus. You know about Him or you wouldn't be here. But you've not met Him. And I can tell you from first-hand experience, there's a big difference. Knowing about Him, it's not worthless, 
but it's just not nearly the same as actually entering into a relationship, a friendship with the risen Christ. He's alive. He's alive. He talks to his people. No, I don't hear audible voices, but he does talk to us. He teaches us. He speaks into our thoughts. He speaks into our hearts. When we read the Bible, he actually helps us to understand it. And he wants you to enter into that kind of friendship, that kind of oneness with him and with his people. And if that's not your experience, he's done everything to make it available to you. All all you need to do is ask him for it. You don't have to get the words right, perfect, whatever. Just, God, I, I, I want that. I need you. I want that. Don't understand it all, but please help me. I I'm willing to trust you with everything. And see, that's what it takes. It, it does take that. Because he's God. He's not going to play second fiddle to anybody. Including you. But he loves you enough to die for you. That's what that cross is all about. That's what this communion is all about. The sacrifice that he gave to make it possible for us to belong with each other and with him and in heaven one day. But it starts here. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for these people who are gathered together this afternoon, Lord, that you're the only one that knows what's going on inside them. You know what's going on in their minds and in their hearts and what their needs are. Meet them, please, right where they are. The ones who need to just surrender and turn their hearts, their whole lives over to you. That help them to see that. And I just I ask you to do for them what you did for me so long ago. Just talk to them. Make them know that that this is all real. And Lord, for the rest of us, please forgive us for having our priorities out of whack all too often. Help us, Lord, to really listen to to discern in those moments when when there's a conflict like there had to have been for Jesus that day his mom is calling to speak with him help us to know what to do in those moments show us what you want us to do and give us the Give us the courage to be obedient. To walk away from our biological relatives in the, in the times when that's what you're calling us to do. To love you more. to live that out. First Corinthians 11, 23, the Apostle Paul said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. Lord Jesus, we thank You for this. We thank You for the bread. We thank You for the cup. We thank You for the reminder that You love us. That You've proved it. That You died to set us free and that one day You're returning. Give us the wisdom to live for eternity, God, and to not be so focused on the here and now that we miss out on what you have for us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's share this together.